An open airway is essential for every patient. You may be called upon to open the airway of a patient who cannot maintain his or her own airway. These will be patients who have an altered level of consciousness, such as a seizure or stroke patient, or someone in cardiac or respiratory arrest. The airway in these patients is usually partially obstructed by the tongue due to loss of muscle tone. An obstructed airway due to the tongue, food, or other foreign object prevents air from reaching the lungs and can ultimately lead to the patient's death. An open airway is essential to the care and survivability of the patient. There are two common techniques used to open the airway known as the head tilt chin lift for medical patients and the jaw thrust for trauma patients. The jaw thrust technique is used to open the airway of an altered or unconscious patient with obvious or suspected trauma. Any patient who presents with an altered level of consciousness or is found unresponsive on the ground without an explanation is presumed to have a head, neck, or spinal injury and must have their spine protected. While opening the airway is essential, it is not more important than protecting the spine. Both elements of the patient's care are of high priority and therefore, we accomplish each element with the jaw thrust maneuver. The jaw thrust maneuver is the only procedure used by EMTs to open the airway with little to no movement of the head or neck. This is accomplished by lifting the jaw, which brings the tongue forward off the posterior hypopharynx without manipulating the spine. This procedure can be accomplished with just your hands. However, since you will be working with the airway, you should also have gloves on those hands Plus, consider using goggles and a mask to prevent being splashed or sprayed by airway or gastric secretions. When you perform the jaw thrust maneuver, take these steps starting with BSI precautions. It is easiest to maintain the jaw thrust maneuver when the patient is in the supine position. Position yourself at the top of the patient's head. However, you may also have to open the airway of a patient who presents in a vehicle after a crash. Position yourself behind the head of a seated patient if possible. Once in position and without moving the patient's head and neck, carefully place one hand on either side of the patient's head near the orbits. Place your thumbs just inferior to the eyes and lateral to the nose. Using your remaining four fingers, place them at the angle of the jaw below the ears. Without moving the head and neck, using your index and middle fingers, push the jaw forward. Jut the jaw out and forward as if creating an exaggerated underbite. Do not manipulate or rotate the head in any way. Assess for breathing and ventilate or apply oxygen as needed. Constantly monitor for changes in the patient's status. If no gag reflex is present, consider insertion of an oropharyngeal airway. Evaluation of circulation forms a critical part of your initial assessment. If blood is not adequately circulated, some of the cells and organs in the body will not receive an adequate supply of oxygen and dangerous waste products will begin to build up. If the problem is not corrected, shock will occur. Severe bleeding or hemorrhage is one of the most common causes of shock. Signs of shock include restlessness or anxiety, pale, cool, and or clammy skin, nausea and vomiting, tachycardia and tachypnea, and as a very late sign, hypotension. Take BSI precautions. This is important because there may be direct contact with possible bloodborne pathogens. Use gloves and goggles at a minimum, a gown for gross hemorrhage, and a mask or face shield for spurting blood. Expose the wound and estimate the amount of blood lost by the patient. Apply firm direct pressure to the wound with a gloved hand and gauze pads or other dressing material. Bleeding from a neck or chest wound should be controlled with an occlusive dressing that prevents any air from entering the wound site. Occlusive materials include any non-breathable substance, such as a gloved hand, Vaseline gauze, or plastic wrap. If bleeding is controlled and does not seem to be seeping through the bandages or coming up through your fingers, then bandage the dressing in place with roller gauze, elastic bandages, triangular bandages, or cravats. To ensure uniform contact and pressure over the wound, 
Rapid Pressure Dressing from Distal to Proximal. Assess distal circulation to ensure that the bandage was not applied too tightly. The intent is to maintain control of the bleeding with continued pressure. If firm, consistent, direct pressure fails to control the hemorrhage, a tourniquet should be applied. A tourniquet can be any material, 2 to 4 inches wide, that can be wrapped tightly around the extremity. But commercial devices are the most successful tourniquets because they have a built-in windlass that allows for proper tightening and continued constriction of the band. Apply the tourniquet at least 2 inches above the wound site and tighten as much as possible. Twist the windlass until bleeding has stopped and distal pulses are no longer palpable. If the tourniquet is not applied tight enough, it will actually increase venous bleeding, similar to when a constricting band is applied for blood draws or IV initiation. For very large or muscular patients, two tourniquets placed next to each other may be required to control hemorrhage. Secure the windlass in place with a strap that covers the windlass, ensuring it will not release the tension you have already applied. Document the time the tourniquet was applied. Some systems want this information literally marked on the patient's forehead so as not to be missed. Now that the hemorrhage has been controlled, you can begin to treat for shock. Appropriate treatment for shock includes properly positioning the patient supine, maintaining the airway and administering high-flow oxygen, reassuring the patient to reduce anxiety, and preventing heat loss by applying a blanket. Prepare the patient for transport and monitor vital signs.